This is a podcast by The Straits Times. Welcome to Green Pulse, a podcast series by The Straits Times where we analyze the beats of the changing environment, from biodiversity conservation to climate change. I'm your host, Audrey Tan, and I cover science and environment for The Straits Times. My co host is David Fogarty. Hi, I'm David, and I'm the climate change editor at The Straits Times. It is the 31st of August. The world is now at an inflection point when it comes to energy. The Russian war on Ukraine is worsening the global energy crisis, highlighting the need for countries to safeguard energy security. At the same time, humanity's long reliance on fossil fuels is having devastating impacts on societies. So how will countries deal with this situation? Will our fossil fuel use go up or down? As countries deliberate on this issue, one fuel type has come under the spotlight, natural gas. The European Commission has made public a draft law that would label some nuclear energy and gas energy projects as green investments. This is the same fuel that powers Singapore and is considered cleaner than coal and oil since it produces less planet warming carbon dioxide when burnt. But natural gas is still a fossil fuel and comprises mainly methane, which has a more powerful warming effect than carbon dioxide on shorter timescales. So the question is, can natural gas really be considered a greener fuel as countries wean themselves off fossil fuels? To help us answer this question, we have on the show today, energy finance analyst Sam Reynolds, who is from the Institute for Energy Economics and Financial Analysis. So thanks for joining us on the show today, Sam. Thanks for having me. Nice to be here. So, Sam, put things into context for us. The Industrial Revolution was powered by the use of coal. When did natural gas start to become a viable alternative to the other forms of fossil fuels? Yeah, thanks, David. So, you know, you're right. I think it started with King Coal, right? This was the fuel of the late 19th, uh, early 20th centuries. It was used really as the backbone of industrial society for all different kinds of applications, you know rail, sea transportation, uh, residential heating, industrial production, electricity generation, all of these things. But, it, you know, with the commercial discovery of the uh, first oil well in Titusville, Pennsylvania in 1859, you know, and then the, the mass production of the automobile, King Cole really started to be dethroned by what Daniel Jurgen, a famous energy historian, has called the hydrocarbon man. And it was really between the kind of post-war period, you know, the 1940s through the 70s, that coal really started to be replaced by all kinds of petroleum-based fuels and natural gas, right? Coal-fired steam engines uh, gave way to petroleum combustion engines, coal ovens replaced with oil and gas heating, all these other things. So, you know, we have King Coal, we have the hydrocarbon man, and I think of kind of natural gas in its early phases as kind of the weird... Uh, distant relative. It was always thought of as kind of a byproduct of oil production that really didn't have much value. It was usually flared or re-injected into oil wells to maintain pressure. But natural gas was hard to capture and hard to transport. It was far away from energy, from consumption centers. And so it was often kind of left in the ground as a uh, stranded asset. You know, I think later in that period, uh, you had innovations in kind of metalworking, pipeline infrastructure, the invention of the combined cycle turbine, as well as kind of a wave of deregulation in the U.S., the U.K., and then continental Europe. And so natural gas really started to play a, a much uh, more important role, right? And then, and then one of the biggest energy developments, you know, certainly in the past 50 years was the shale revolution in which the successful combination of hydraulic fracturing and, and horizontal drilling really opened up U.S. oil and gas production in a way that no one could have uh, imagined. And this kind of happened overnight. And so, you know, the U.S. is blessed with all this low-cost domestic supply. And in order to access markets abroad, it starts to really develop its LNG or liquefied natural gas 
export infrastructure. And, you know, around this period, 2011, the IEA, International Energy Agency, called this the golden age of gas. You had all these countries, Australia, Qatar, Russia, United States, really looking for new markets for their, for their gas abroad. And then, you know, more recently in 2019, someone called LNG the champagne of fuels. And I think that's kind of brings us to today, although, you know, champagne of fuels, if it was expensive in 2019 at about $10 per unit in Asia, it's now around $60. So I guess whatever kind of expensive liquor you can, you can name, I think that's, that's where we are with LNG. So Sam, we know that when it comes to fossil fuel use, other than the pollution that it causes that affects people living nearby, another big issue is the carbon dioxide that the burning of such fuels produce. So what exactly are the environmental credentials of gas? If gas is still a fossil fuel, why are some people saying that it's green? Yeah, so certainly the dominant narrative in many parts of the world and amongst many circles of policymakers is that natural gas is cleaner than than coal. Well, you know, in my mind, that's not really saying much. You know, natural gas, to its credit, emits about 40 to 50 percent less carbon dioxide when it's uh, burned. It also emits less particulate matter and, and uh, sulfur dioxide. Um, but at the same time, you know, there are, there are problems here. Natural gas emits significant amounts of nitrogen dioxide, which, uh, as you may know, are, are important creators of haze and, and respiratory illnesses, water pollution, uh, acid rain, things like that. The, the real problem, though, is that the main component of natural gas is methane. And methane is a greenhouse gas that is 90 times more potent, more harmful for the environment than carbon dioxide over a 20 year period. And so put differently, you know, each molecule of methane has 90 times more heat trapping potential than every molecule of carbon dioxide. And so the scientific community really considers you know, reducing methane emissions from natural gas, oil and gas production and other sources to be the low hanging fruit of climate mitigation, right? According to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, global methane emissions have to be slashed by 40% in order to keep the world on track for 1.5 degrees Celsius. And so you say, okay, we're going to measure the methane emissions and we're going to try and cut them. But it always feels to me like the more we study methane, the less we actually know about how much is being emitted. So there's just been study after study showing that methane emissions are globally uh, uh, and woefully underreported. Recently, IEA came out with a study that said national disclosures of methane emissions were being underreported by 70 percent. And so, you know, any kind of threat or, you know, problem that you hear about methane emissions, I think, is probably an underestimate to, to, to the harm that it's doing to our climate. We recently heard that the European Union will continue to count natural gas and nuclear as green energy in some circumstances. Um, and even in Southeast Asia, we've heard repeatedly about how natural gas plants could be considered a green project. And that qualifies them to still receive funding from banks and other financial institutions. Maybe tell us a bit more about what the financial players are saying about natural gas. Sure. Yeah, it's a great question. And I'll just briefly touch on what you're referring to. You know, a major catalyst for reducing greenhouse gas emissions and, and stimulating investment in green technologies is th these kind of green financial instruments, you know, green loans, sustainability linked bonds in capital markets. And, and one way of defining where capital should flow to be called sustainable is through these things called taxonomies. Uh, taxonomies are basically just classification systems for uh, sustainable technologies. And it provides the private sector, the financial sector, policymakers with kind of a common language on technologies that are green or sustainable. And the aim is really to shift investments into these technologies. Now, taxonomies were supposed to be, you know, wholly science based uh, documents that aim to reduce kind of significant harm from qualifying for these new forms of capital. Um, but what happened is a lot of a lot of the uh, political processes around them were dominated by lobbying interests from natural gas and nuclear 
industries and they really co-opted with these these basically systems for classifying green technologies into including natural gas. And so you have, you know, these taxonomies in the European Union and South Korea and, and others starting to think about natural gas as a transition fuel or a, you know, sustainable investment. In, in some cases, um, like the Indonesian taxonomy, they use a red light, yellow light, green light system. And natural gas has been placed under uh, these kind, this kind of yellow light as like, um, you know, maybe maybe slow down, but also maybe speed up in the in the future to get it, get in there while you can kind of thing. And so, you know, several markets, including China, are have, have kind of led the way on this and are rejecting gas in the taxonomy. But it's really become a political issue. Now, at the same time, other financiers like multilateral development banks have maybe discounted new upstream oil and gas projects but are still considering financing for midstream, you know, transportation of gas and, and downstream burning of gas as sustainable fuels. And I think just one thing that strikes me as kind of a great irony here is that taxonomies are supposed to tell you what sustainable technologies are, but recognizing gas as both transitional and sustainable seems kind of incompatible to me especially considering that the IEA anticipates gas demand globally to peak by about 2025. And so, you know, this idea that they're sustainable is really, um, really more of a political question than a, than a scientific question. Find us on Apple, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or via the Google Voice Assistant and Amazon Alexa-enabled devices. And now back to our podcast episode. So, Sam, another question mark on gas plants is that any gas investments today would mean that they remain in operation for decades to come. So that basically means lots of greenhouse gas emissions. And I guess related to this also, LNG or liquefied natural gas prices, I think, close to record prices, uh, certainly in Asia. So, and I know you recently wrote about this, looking at the impacts on Asia and LNG demand. So do you think this will also hurt the growth of LNG in Asia going forward, or was it just a, a bump in the road? Yeah, so the the whole pitch for adopting natural gas and LNG infrastructure in Asia has really been threefold. That natural gas is cheap, it's reliable, and it's clean. And over the past, I would say, about a year, even before the Russian invasion of Ukraine, we've really seen this narrative about gas as reliable and cheap and clean start to erode, right? Certainly LNG prices in Asia have continued to skyrocket to some of their highest levels of all time. Buyers are being increasingly priced out of the market. You know, countries like Pakistan have really struggled to secure supplies even when they have long-term contracts in place because their contracted suppliers have seen higher prices in other markets elsewhere and so they've simply just defaulted on deliveries and, and resold cargoes at a profit of, you know, multi, multi million dollars. And, you know, all the while, Pakistani citizens are facing eight to 10 hours of load shedding a day and, you know, widespread fuel shortages and power outages. So this narrative that natural gas has really pitched itself as it is being undermined as prices continue to skyrocket. Now, I think there are other, you know, important nuances here. The emerging Asia is expected because of uh, rapid GDP growth expectations and rising energy demand growth expectations. The region is expected to be the largest growth market for natural gas and LNG worldwide. And so it's really the industry has really pinned its hopes on the growth of demand there. And so I just recently published a, a report, you know, making the argument that at sustained high prices, in other words, should high prices persist, as many expect them to for the next several years, countries could start to look elsewhere for fuels. They could start to look to domestic energy alternatives, be it reserves of coal, natural gas, nuclear or, you know, rapidly declining costs of renewable energy is being deployed to meet higher and higher levels of, of electricity demand growth. So, you know, there's been the assumption in the industry that 
uh, the growth of natural gas demand in Asia was a given. And I really don't think that should be the assumption, considering that there are other alternatives for, for fuels and that, that these countries may look to, to those alternatives instead of uh, liquefied natural gas. So, Sam, in your opinion, is there a need for a transition fuel? You know, we talked about that narrative of gas being a transition fuel. And how quickly can we scale up the deployment of solar and wind uh, to meet the energy needs of billions of people around the world? So it's certainly an important question, and I get asked it all the time. I think it really depends on the market. Certainly, Asian countries are expected to grow very rapidly, along with electrification goals and decarbonization goals. And I think there will be a role for natural gas to play in the future. I think a good example here is the Philippines, which has uh, really seen its domestic reserves of natural gas start to deplete. Now, it's going to need imported LNG to continue to run its its natural gas fired power plants. There's no way around it. But, you know, given high prices, given volatility in international commodity markets, it seems clear at the same time that the goal for these countries should be to minimize their reliance on these kind of unreliable and volatile fossil fuels while really aiming to maximize the deployment of more secure domestic energy sources that are uh, declining in cost, i.e. renewables. You know, so And that's not what we're seeing. We're seeing countries continue to dig um, themselves into deeper and deeper holes by committing to building more natural gas and LNG-fired infrastructure. About four to $500 billion of gas investments are being proposed throughout Asia. And this is happening at a time when LNG is becoming all the more unaffordable and, and harder to source. And so really, you know, the best way out of a hole is to stop digging. That's not what we're seeing. We're continuing to see the pipeline of natural gas investments um, grow. And I think there needs to be a, a rethink of the national energy priorities towards uh, more sustainable uh, domestic energy systems. Thanks, Sam. I guess on a related note, other than um, the renewable energy that, that we are familiar with today, like solar and wind, there's also green hydrogen, which is an emerging fuel that lots of countries hope to scale up rapidly. Do you think that can be a transition fuel for Asia? Would it be cost effective, for instance, to modify existing gas infrastructure to use hydrogen? Yeah, so hydrogen, I I fully expect to be a very important piece of the clean energy puzzle, right? It, it's especially important in decarbonizing some of the hardest to abate sectors like heavy industry, petrochemicals, aviation fuels, maritime shipping, etc. These sectors, I think, represent a combined 10% of global emissions, and they're going to need to be reduced dramatically to meet global climate targets. Now, the role for natural gas infrastructure in this transition to green hydrogen, I think, is much more up for debate. There are a lot of problems with blending green hydrogen into existing natural gas infrastructure, you know, safety being the first and foremost concern. Hydrogen can, can weaken metal or polyethylene pipes and increase leakage risks. Hydrogen is also much more explosive than natural gas. It's, it's only been tested up to a 20% blending rate of hydrogen into these natural gas pipelines. Some estimates for how much you can blend are much lower. So any introduction of, of hydrogen into existing infrastructure needs to be done on a case-by-case -case basis that's going to require extensive study, testing, modifications. And it's not something that should be rushed or should, should really uh, be taken as a given. You know, from the cost perspectives, I've seen estimates that say that, uh, you know, retrofitting existing pipelines can add up to 20% of the original cost of the pipeline. You know, you'd also have to convert compressor infrastructure to maximize the flow of energy since hydrogen requires three times uh, the, the amount, the volume, to meet the same energy requirements under natural gas. So, you know, all of these things kind of point to the idea that this may blending into existing infrastructure may not be the most cost effective or safe option. So basically, we cannot make investments into gas today thinking that they could be repurposed for the 
future kind of fuel. Yeah, I think. And that kind of lock, locks in the fossil fuel uh, infrastructure for you know a good few decades. Right. I'm sure there will be all kinds of people that aim to use this this idea that you can blend hydrogen into natural gas pipelines as a justification for the continued build out of, of pipeline and natural gas infrastructure. And I think that's um, the wrong way to look at Thank it. Thank you so much for joining us today, Sam, and explaining all about the history of fossil fuel use and the path forward. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks very much, Sam. Well, that's a wrap for Greenhouse, and we hope you enjoyed our discussion. For more on climate change and the environment, do check out our stories in The Straits Times. And don't forget to subscribe to our Green Pulse podcast series on your favourite audio apps, Apple Podcasts, Spotify or Google Podcasts. That was a podcast by The Straits Times. Send your feedback to podcast at sph.com.sg. Find us on Apple, Spotify, Google Podcasts or via the Google Voice Assistant and Amazon Alexa-enabled devices. For more podcasts by The Straits Times, The Business Times and Money FM 89.3, you can also download the audio by SPH app. That's A-W-E-D-I-O.